my presentation, let's see if I can, yeah, is going to be on trade conflicts, technological change, and the future of world trade. But I, I found Governor Novotny's and President Svoboda's uh, introductory remarks very interesting because I'm going to focus very much on economics, and I have for much of my career. But if you don't um, take into account the social aspects of global change, the economics is not going to help you very much. Um, we've seen a number of cases where, from an economics point of view, we see voters voting against their economic interests. Um, and the reason they're voting against their economic interests is because it's more than economics that often drives their decision making. So uh, I can't dive very deeply into that, although I will say for one part of my career, I worked for um, part of the US Department of Agriculture that managed our relationship with large uh, universities in the US called land grant universities. And I was responsible for the social science research portfolio, which included a number of categories. Agricultural economics was one, but also rural sociology. And I have to say, in that post, I learned more from the rural sociologists, probably because I didn't know as much, <laughs> but also because the issues that they were addressing about rural development in the United States were very important. And President Svoboda mentioned cities. Um, and immigration, migration, emigration. In the United States, there was a long, still is, a very long-term challenge around rural development. And in the 30 years that I've been working in economic analysis, uh, and when I was with this part of the US Department of Agriculture, a key goal was to reduce the disparity between urban and rural areas. And they were not successful. And when I was there, everybody thought the new digital economy, e-commerce, was going to fix this because people could now work in the rural areas um, and connect to the urban areas. Um, and they were wrong. Okay, They can do that. But there are agglomeration effects um, where it turns out that these new technologies benefit a lot from being close to one another and having agglomerated labor markets and things like that. So. Um, that's not what my talk is about, but uh, I, I found the intro comments by, um, uh, well, and, and by the way, uh, Governor Novotny mentioned he was going to go meet with Chinese bankers. I spent a lot of time in Asia, and the difference between Asia and their view of trade and Europe and the United States is just amazing. Uh, everybody in Asia that I talk to wants more trade. Often they want more managed trade. <laughs> Uh, not necessarily free trade. Um, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation. So I'm going to give you a quick update on global trade developments. I'm going to give you a reminder of the drivers of trade growth. And uh, just the other day, the uh, IMF released its uh, uh, WIO, World Economic Outlook, with a piece on trade, reminding folks about the importance of macroeconomic forces in driving trade rather than trade policy. I work at a place and have worked for much of my career at places that are very focused on trade policy. Um, and uh, trade policy is important. I will emphasize it is very important. But it is not the main driver of trade. So. That's not always popular when I say that. It certainly was not popular when I was saying that within the US government. Um, so uh, I'll also talk about GVC developments, particularly with respect to Central and East European countries. Uh, they've benefited very significantly from integration in Europe. And we have a forthcoming report that will release next week in, at the spring meetings in Washington. It's a joint report with a number of organizations where we do a deep dive on the developments in global value change, and there's a pretty significant focus on Central and Eastern Europe. I'm then going to give you some basic numbers um, and uh, talk a little bit about rising uncertainty and the importance of uncertainty, and then share some thinking about how we organize our economic thinking in terms of looking at the future of trade. And this was something that I, again, experienced a lot. I've experienced it in Geneva. I experienced it in Washington. I experienced it in China and uh, Malaysia, wherever I travel. 
there's a lot of um, magical thinking around the role of trade. And you need to discipline that thinking with some economic frameworks. Okay, so I'm going to belabor you on how you can use economic frameworks to discipline your thinking about the future of uh, global trade growth. I'll then show you some trade policy scenarios. And if I have time, I often run out of time, I'll talk about uh, China 2030 rebalancing. So the world has changed a lot in the last 35 years. I can assure you the world is going to change a lot more in the next 35 years. And the role of China is going to change quite significantly. I'm quite confident of that. I'm not betting my pension on it, but um, I'm pretty confident that we're going to see pretty dramatic changes. All right, so the quick update about what's going on. We do this thing called the World Trade Outlook Indicator at the WTO. It's like a barometer of trade developments, and we follow a number of these uh, leading indicators. Um, and you can see that uh, a number of these leading indicators are red. Uh, in other words, they're, they're weakening. This is particularly important. Automobile production and sales, um, export orders, freight, uh, a lot of negative indicators uh, on the global uh, trade frontier. Interestingly, in quarter three, we saw a trade volume up, and I can explain that. That was a lot of folks trying to get their exports into places like the United States before more tariffs went in, into effect. Um, but we pointed towards slower trade growth in the first quarter of 2019. We just the other day, yesterday I think it was, I can't remember actually, I think it was yesterday. Uh, we, we re no, it was the day before. We released our trade forecast in Geneva and we basically saw a pretty significant or pretty grim slowdown. And I'm going to tell you that like the IMF, the World Bank, OECD, when they do their GDP forecasts, you tend to have a bias upward a little bit. Well, let's put it this way. You bias against the negative news because you don't want to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, we are a bit, uh, we're negative. We see a pretty significant slowdown. That's a slowdown, not a decrease in trade. It's pretty hard to get a decrease. You need something like the, the great financial crisis to do that. Uh, but we see a slowdown. Uh, we saw a slowdown in 2018 compared to what we were expected, although it was very close to our range that we had predicted. Um, and we do see a bit of a rebound, and this is that optimism, right? If you look at IMF, OECD, GDP forecasts, they have this tendency to say, hey, we're, we're going to have a troubled period, and then we're going to start to come out of it. And as I said, Economic growth is a big driver of trade growth, and so that's going to drive our trade forecast more positive. But I will tell you this, the downside risks are far greater than the upside risks. So um, we expect, if anything, if we're going to do, when we do a revision, we'll do a revision in October, uh, it very likely uh, will be more on the downside. We will be using this World Trade Outlook indicator, which we do quarterly, to help inform our, our revision of the trade forecast in the fall. The trade tensions pose the um, greatest risk to the forecast. A relaxation of those tensions could provide some upside potential. If you read the news this morning, there may be a US-China deal. That could be very good for global markets. I'm not sure it's very good for global trade. I'm not sure it's very good for the WTO, we have this thing called most favored nations trading arrangements. And if we have managed trade between the US and China, that seems to be a bit contradictory uh, to the notion of most favored nations. It might be uh, somewhat good for the bilateral trade balance between the US and China, uh, but I don't think it'll have much to do with the overall trade balance for the US. Um, by the way, recent academic research examining trade flows has largely confirmed I.O. simulations, international organization simulations. I worked very closely with the IMF and the World Bank and OECD in the G20 context. And we um, have run scenarios and reported this to the G20 about the potential effects of the trade conflict, and all of our analysis is largely in line. And recent uh, evaluation of trade data and other developments, prices looking at trade diversion, um, confirm 
uh, some of our, well, almost all of our results. I would say the great thing, I sent an email this morning to my boss in Geneva saying um, the, the good thing for economists, trade economists in particular about the trade conflict, is it's like a controlled experiment. It's a great natural, ex not a controlled, but a natural experiment to validate our trade models, which have been subject to a lot of criticism in the past, um, but that's because they weren't necessarily uh, interpreted the right way. But the trade models are working pretty well now. So we have weak import demand in Europe uh, and Asia, dampening global trade volumes, particularly in 2018. The last quarter of 2018 was a disaster, okay? Uh, trade growth uh, pretty much stagnated. It had been pretty decent through uh, the first three quarters, but then the last quarter was pretty bad. Uh, values are up because of energy prices. That's a good thing. Energy prices are recovering. That helps uh, resource exporting countries a lot, uh, particularly if they're exporting energy. Um, the problem is, is if we have a global slowdown, those resource and commodity exporters, uh, exports and their uh, investment uh, profile can be heavily negatively affected by uh, global GDP developments. Services growth has been relatively strong, particularly for developing countries. So many developing countries are worried about the servicification of global trade, and yet much of our analysis suggests that even though it looks like the US, Europe have comparative advantage in services, there's a lot of trade and services between developing countries that can occur, and um, we see it happening. So um, this is just to look at a uh, history of what's called the trade elasticity. This is the uh, percentage change in trade to the percentage change in GDP growth, trade volume growth, not value growth. We try to look at uh, volume rather than value because of things like energy prices and commodity prices. You can see that during something called the long 1990s, this period here, um, the trade elasticity was pretty high. And I can tell you that that you know, above two um, is uh, historically unusual. It can occur occasionally, um, but not with this kind of sustained um, uh, performance. And this was largely due to the opening up of China, India, and the European centrally planned economies, where the trade elasticity increased quite a bit as um, countries that had been outside of the global trading system or at least restricted from participation in it uh, started participating quite a bit. This is what's been happening recently. We can see that the trade elasticity has been around one or slightly less than one. Uh, these numbers are subject to revisions and um, as trade data comes in, but um, they're pretty, they're not going to move very much from around one. And we had a recovery in 2017, and we were pretty optimistic that that might be returning to what we consider to be the long term average. So if you look at something like the trade elasticity going back to the mid 1800s, the average is between 1.3 and 1.5. And that's what we think is probably reasonable um, going forward. After this great integration, we think that um, in normal times, we would see a trade elasticity between 1.3 and 1.5. And in 2017, we had a recovery to 1.6. But now 2018, we see it's not preliminary anymore. It's, it's actual. It's, um, it's back down around 1. So. Um, this is, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is what the IOs were predicting in January. Those numbers now, this, these lines would be coming down like this as everybody updates their forecast, including us. Um, but uh, we were all pretty much in alignment that trade growth was going to be weak. And uh, now that the new data has come in, we think it's going to be weaker than we thought back then. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't see an, an opportunity for this to turn around. The downside risks are much higher. Rising trade tensions and increased use of trade measures make forecasts for trade and output less certain, with the downside risks being quite substantial. 
All right, so integration has slowed compared to the rapid pace of the long 1990s. At that time, we had this opening up, this integration of many regions of the world. That involved unilateral liberalization. At the same time, there was a lot of regional and multilateral integration going on, a lot of RTAs, regional trade agreements, preferential trade agreements. And at the WTO, we had the Uruguay Round, um, the Information Technology Agreement, uh, a fair number of um, um, liberalization um, episodes. This resulted in rapid trade growth and integration. But, and this is a point that I want to keep emphasizing, is that openness policies account for about 25% of trade growth. Most growth is due to fundamental and reasonably synchronized macro growth, as well as falling trade costs that are not necessarily related to openness policies. So you can think of containerization, digitalization. Those things affect trade costs in ways that are not directly related to policies. Um, and then technology also. Um, this is important, and this is something that policymakers often um, don't take into account, and I ran into this a lot in the U.S. Um, government. This thing that I worked for, the U.S. International Trade Commission, is an independent U.S. government organization. It's not part of the administration. It's not part of Congress. And our job was to independently evaluate trade policy changes. And I kept getting criticized by the pro-trade administration and congressional members as not generating big enough effects from the trade agreements, um, and then criticized by the anti-trade folks for not having big enough negative effects. What we showed was that some sectors would win, some sectors would lose, and on net there was a small positive gain. That's not a surprise to many economists, right? Um, <clears throat> And they would say, but look, the trade is growing much faster than you say. And I would say, well, that's because of fundamental macro factors. And if you take um, two sets of data, countries for which the US has changed its trade policy with a, a, maybe a free trade agreement, and then a group of countries for which the US has not changed any of its trade policies, and you compare trade growth, you see about, believe it or not, a 25% difference in trade growth. Trade grew in both sets, but those with which you had a free trade agreement, it grew about 25% faster. Most policymakers, the trade policymakers, want to argue that all trade growth is due to their, their tariff negotiations. Now, this is not necessarily popular in Geneva, although I'm, I'm happy to say my boss, Director General Acevedo, um, understands this and, and buys into it. I would say that that 25% is important. It's particularly important in terms of the long-term dynamism and the ability of developing countries to have their production possibility frontier shift out towards the global frontier. That's the magic of, um, it's not necessarily the compa comparative static welfare gains, it's the ability to import the best uh, uh, capital, the best um, parts and components, and the best technology, the best know-how in order to shift out your production possibility frontier, raise productivity, and raise living standards. Counter protectionist measures have not translated into significant measured rises in trade costs until recently, um, and I'll, I'll have some fundamental data on that here coming up soon. Um, and um, one of the key elements, though, and this affects those macro factors that I just described, is uncertainty. So it's not clear that tariffs necessarily have a big long-term effect on, on those macro forces, um, but the uncertainty around those tariffs can have just as big effect or bigger than the tariff effects. So I didn't say that they have no effect. Tariffs have no effect. I said they may have a small effect but once you add uncertainty into that, then it gets to be potentially much bigger. And if uncertainty starts affecting firms' investment decisions and consumers' consumption decisions, the effects of the trade conflict are likely to get much bigger than, um, than otherwise. 
but we don't know for sure. We see preliminary indicators that, I mean, investment's been weak since the great financial crisis, and um, uh, what's the term? Anecdotal uh, information on investment decisions and uh, uh, updates of investment data suggest that investment has been weak and weaker than expected. What we do see is a lot of, uh, as a so we don't see a lot of uh, short-term overly dramatic effect, as, uh, as I said, on macro indicators. Um, there are lessons from the Great Depression and the Great Recession uh, about the effects of trade. What we do see right now is a lot of sector and country trade shifting. And I like to describe this. In the United States, we have these little games at uh, fairs or circuses. It's where a little animal, um, we call them moles, right? There's a, a table with about 10 or 12 different animals that can stick their head up. And you have a rubber mallet, and you're trying to whack the mole, depending on where it sticks, it, which one sticks its head up. And it comes up quickly and goes down. Well, this is what happens um, when you try to put tariffs on particular countries or particular sectors, you get trade diversion. And it happens. It's in the data. It's very, very evident. And it's happening now. Um, and so uh, the US administration's efforts at stopping imports from China may be successful on imports from China, but not overall imports, as we see in the data. And our models predict other countries, particularly Southeast Asia and Mexico, benefit as a result. Some of that might come back to what we call onshoring, back to the US, but very little. And the data so far suggests that there's been very little coming back to the US. Now, <clears throat> I want to shift a little bit and talk about um, long-term projections. Uh, there may be skepticism. Excuse me for a second. I need to pour some water. Um, there may be some skepticism around. I got it, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, around economic modeling. This is some work that uh, we did at the WTO in uh, 2012. And we built, uh, working with a research institute in Paris called CEPI, uh, we built a long-term uh, trade model projecting into the future alternative scenarios, high growth and low growth. The blue lines are high growth scenarios. And that's high growth around things like um, uh, uh, education development, improvement of the labor force, uh, women's participation in the labor force, investment, total factor productivity. So the blue lines reflect a positive view of the evolution of those fundamental forces that drive economic growth and trade growth. The broken line there is trade. The top line is GDP. The, uh, the, sorry, the top lines are GDP, the bottom lines are trade. The blue lines, the high scenario, the red lines are the low scenario. The green lines, can you see them? Is what's actually happened since 2012. So the models have done reasonably well at capturing where the global economy is going to go. And what it tells you when you look at the green lines, is that the world growth has been near the low growth scenario. And I think if you talk to macroeconomists, they would say that's the case. And you can see trade has performed perhaps a little better than GDP growth. That's largely Asia and developing countries. Uh, but it's still closer to the low growth scenario than the high growth scenario. Uh, this is one of my favorite charts. It's from the World Bank. I stole it from them. This shows you how um, the network of global trade has changed from the 1980s through 2014. This is system, systemic relevance in global trade. This is the US, Europe, and Japan. OK, so in 1980, if you knew what was happening in these six or seven countries, you could forecast trade growth very easily. Unfortunately, I wasn't there trying to forecast trade growth in the 1980s. I'm here. I'm trying to forecast trade growth 
where the world has shifted. There are many more significant players, systemically relevant players in global trade. And you can see that the most systemically relevant global trader in 2014 is China. There's still, you know, Europe, Germany, uh, France, uh, still a lot of uh, European, and the U.S. is in there also. But in a sense, there's a lot more opportunities for countries to trade with one another than there were in, in, in the 1980s, which I find interesting because in the 1980s, the U.S. administration used the very, very tight trade relationships between the U.S. and Japan to negotiate something called the Plaza Agreement, as well as a number of other elements in there that dramatically changed the trade relationship between the US and Japan. Interestingly, what Japan did, and I suspect China's gonna do this now because there's a similar kind of negotiation going on, and one of the key players was a, now was a key player then, Japan then focused on offshoring and outward FDI and shifting a lot of it, it, it it essentially helped start the global value chain uh, evolution, that agreement. That's my assertion. Um, and now we have this US-China negotiation going on. And what we, we've already observed, a lot of outward FDI from China uh, as wages have risen. And Chinese firms want to move up the the, up the value chain in terms of parts and components, and they're shifting assembly off, offshore. Any U.S.-China agreement is likely to, well, the tariffs that the U.S. administration has put in place is causing that shift to happen faster, um, and any agreement is likely to lock it in place. So um, this is trade diversion. Well, what's interesting is I don't understand why countries are um, um, being forced by the U.S. to deal bilaterally. Um, if you look at something like this, and it would say you have more trading options than you did in the 1980s. Yes, the U.S. still has a lot of trade power and influence, but it's diminished quite a bit since the 1980s. Um, uh, I can't answer that question. You have to ask your own policymakers. Why are you letting the U.S come in and twist your arm. Um, if you work hard, there'll be some disruption in the short run, but you ought to be able to shift to other markets. All right, I'm gonna rush through this. This is just basically making the case that, particularly over the last 35 years, trade and GDP growth have been highly correlated, generally, more open trade has resulted in, along with doing other good things in your economy, has been associated with faster trade growth. Often that's because you get access to developed country demand uh, for your products, um, and so you can expand uh, demand beyond your domestic demand. It's been uh, a very key contributor to the reduction in uh, poverty. Trade is highly correlated, once again, with poverty reduction. One needs to think about the current circumstances and what's going to happen with the SDGs. Can emerging market countries power future reductions in poverty? One of the things that we observe in the data is that trade between developing countries is growing much faster than trade between developed countries. Okay, so developing country to developing country trade is growing fast, as well as developing country to developed, and that's growing faster than developed to developed. Now, we have weak investment, a key element to driving the SDGs is strong investment in the developing world, and we see relatively weak global investment, although investment in the developing world has been sustained better than um, in the developed world. But I think there's a lot of questions around the attainability of the SDGs. Uh, there is a view, and it's one that I buy into, that for the Millennium Development Goals, trade was a key driver in poverty reduction. And we believe that trade can be a, continue to be a key driver in poverty reduction. We also believe that developing countries can do more on their own, by liberalizing trade between themselves. Because if you look at tariffs, 
and trade costs between developing countries, they're much higher. I think I have a chart on that coming up. You can see that tariffs have come down, but reform has stalled since the early 2000s. This is tariffs in developed countries. The band is um, the range, essentially, of tariffs. Uh, so you can see that both the, the average has declined and the variance has declined. There's been a decline in the developed, developing world and again a big decline in variance. This decline in variance has a lot to, uh, is one indicator of uncertainty. So we've seen global uncertainty come down over the years, uh, but now we're worried that it's rising because of unilateral actions in a number of countries. Uh, yeah, I did have trade costs here. So this is using some gravity model uh, um, estimates and then, you know, uh, using the, these are not econometric estimates. These are calculations from a gravity model uh, where you have to make some parameter assumptions and I can share the paper with you if you're interested. But what I think is most important here is if you look at manufacturing trade costs are about 104 percent based on this database and it's why odd data, Robert. Um, and um, global average tariffs are 8%. So there's still a lot of trade costs completely unrelated to tariffs. So tariffs are less than 10% by this calculation of total trade costs. Between, developing, between developed countries, trade costs are lower, about 89%, but developing to developing, it's 140%. So it's much higher, developing to developing trade costs are much higher, uh, the implicit trade costs are much higher than between developed countries. And as you can see, agriculture has higher implicit trade costs, particularly agriculture between developing countries, and services trade costs between developing countries are particularly high. So there's a lot of opportunity for developing countries to trade with one another and reduce their, um, their trade costs. And, and then, you know, we're trying to do some experimentation. How many of you, I want to see a show of hands, have read uh, Richard Baldwin, my colleague at the Graduate Institute's book on globotics? Okay. So Richard has a very important insight there. He's basically saying services trade costs, these trade costs here are going to come down a lot, and they're going to be driven by, th by technology. So things like broadband subscriptions, also, uh, machine learning, uh, machine translation for languages, and then automated uh, credits and contracts, blockchain kinds of things. We find that those things don't explain, at least in this analysis, and we have to, this is very, very preliminary, we find that those things don't explain a lot of trade costs. Okay? So this is econometrics here, um, taking that data and trying to uh, estimate it against a bunch of, of um, potential explanatory variables. And what we find is that a lot of it's unexplained. So um, now, maybe he's right, and I, we definitely need to revise and work and understand these numbers deeper, but um, it's not necessarily clear that these technolo technological innovations, they're, they're clearly going to reduce trade costs. But it's not clear that they're necessarily going to reduce them so much that there'll be a major upheaval in the services sector. All right, now I'm going to switch a little bit to what's happened to Central and East European countries in global value chains. So this is uh, some analysis that's from the introductory chapter of this new um, book coming out. We're going to release it next week in Washington. Uh, actually, it's a week from Saturday um, at the spring meetings. Um, and what you can see here, uh, this is, uh, these are complex graphs, and it's very, I don't want to spend too much time on them. I want you to t take away what's happened between, for Europe, between the blue bars and the orange bars. Um, and you can see that simple forward GVC activities in, towards Asia, so this is these countries shipping products towards Asia, you can see that Europe has declined between 2000 and 2017, but um, 
and Eastern Europe's share has actually um, stayed about the same or increased a little bit. So there's been this decline in this simple forward GVC activities in manufacturing. There's been an, a stable development around more complex. That's when parts and components cross borders more than once. But a much bigger role for the Eastern European countries in those complex value chains. This is probably, my guess is automobiles. Uh, you may know this a little bit better than I do in your region. But um, so the story is uh, towards Asia, a decline in Europe in terms of simple GVC activities in manufacturing, stability in complex uh, GVCs, but um, an increasing role for Eastern Europe in the complex GVC activities. If you look at just Europe, and here I'm going to go looking forward and backward, uh, you can see that there is um, a, a decline again in Western Europe in simple, stability in the complex, but again, Eastern Europe's role is increasing. This is probably obvious, but it does show up in the GVC data that increasingly Eastern Europe is central <laughs> to competitiveness for European GVCs. Um, and this works whether you're looking forward or integration backward into the economy, and the integration backward is even more important in the complex GVCs. Now this is looking at the evolution of trade networks. You can see for Europe, Germany, very, very central. It's very hard to read these smaller graphs. I'm sorry about that. Um, the report will be out in a little over a week, and you can look in chapter one. Um, you can see in 2000, Japan was very important. China was large, but not particularly, you know, no, it was smaller than Japan. And now if you look, China's much bigger, and I think this is Japan over here. So China's role in Asian uh, trade networks for all goods and services in increased dramatically. Um, Germany remains a very big player, but what's probably very hard to see here is the, the role of traditional Western European countries has actually diminished, and the role of Central and East European countries has increased very significantly. So the story this tells is that integration, economic integration in Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe has shown up very strongly in the data. That does not mean sociologically everybody's happy and satisfied with the outcomes, but it shows up in the data very carefully. And um, this is, the, so that was, uh, I think that was complex. No, that was traditional and simple. You see a very similar story with, again, the rise of Central and East European countries uh, and a diminishment of Japan. But keep in mind, while Japan has diminished, many of the activities in China are funded by Japanese firms or other Asian firms that have invested in China. So a lot of people think, particularly in the United States, people think, well, these are US companies that invested in China and offshored their, uh, their production. No, it's a lot of Asian companies that invested in China. Um, some of them integrated into US, large US multinational supply chains, but most of the economic activity in Asia is within Asia. All right, now some basic trade facts. Um, so global trade in 2017 was around $22 trillion, $17 trillion in goods uh, trade, $5 trillion in services trade. Services trade is growing faster. Um, US-China trade was about 3% of global trade. And under the current administration, the average U.S. tariff increased from about 1.4% to 3.2%. So the U.S. average tariff has doubled as a result of the trade conflict and other measures. Trade conflict with China. This is also anti-dumping on washing machines and things like that. Um, so that's not a good thing. Um, global automobile trade 
is 8% of global trade. So US-China trade 3%. And remember, I said global average tariffs are about 8%, OK? Um, and total trade cost for manufacturing is about 100%. <clears throat> tariffs are something you can control, you can influence. The other parts of trade costs are much more difficult to, to influence. They're dependent on um, things like technological innovation. So my point that I want to make here, and I'm not getting at it very well, though, is the U.S.-China trade conflict is affecting about 3% of global trade. That's small. If the U.S. administration increases its tariffs on automobiles, that affects a much bigger share of global trade and is likely to have more significant effects. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, total trade that occurs, total global trade of that particularly $17 trillion in goods, 75% of global trade, when you look at the customs data, is essentially using WTO MFN trade. That's hard for many people to believe, given the proliferation of preferential trade agreements. But 75% of global trade is actually done at w, under WTO, most favored nation trade. Um, for Europe, it's higher. It's in the 80s. Two thirds of global trade, two thirds of that 75%, so that means 50 percentage points of global trade is most favored nation zero. 25 percentage points are, is, is most favored nation tariffs greater than zero. Okay, but the preferential trade arrangements, the PTAs, do not provide enough of an incentive for countries to then claim the uh, PTA trading arrangement. There's a cost to complying with rules of origin and things like that. Was that clear? I see some heads nodding yes. Um, so this is an argument that the WTO trading arrangements are critical to global trade. Now, if they break down, and this is an exercise we want to look at, is if they break down, and let's say we, we broke down global cooperation around tariffs, and we've got estimates of what that might be. We've used them in some scenarios. Um, the implications would be then that more trade would then occur under regional trade agreements. So, Right now, the WTO MFN tariffs are the foundation. What happens if that foundation is removed? And what do RTAs, or preferential trade agreements, then provide for a foundation? And we would argue that there will be one, but it'll be much smaller. OK? It'll be much smaller. And those difficult areas that are often uh, difficult at the multilateral level, they always get built into the regional trade agreements. Nobody touches agriculture, usually, in regional trade agreements, except maybe under some TRQ arrangements. Um, those areas are going to remain difficult. And we think that, um, that you've got to deal with them at a multilateral level. And I, I, I won't talk about subsidies, but I, um, there is a lot of interest around subsidies. It's an area that uh, applied policy research, researchers have not done a good enough job keeping up with, and now it's becoming very, very important. And there is some uh, efforts with us, the World Bank and IMF, to try to deal with this. We'll see if, they, if we can uh, take that forward. It's complex, it's difficult, um, but hopefully we can do it. All right, so we did some simulations using the kind of model. It's a new model. It's updated from that one that I showed you with the high and low scenarios. It performs similarly. It uses the same kinds of drivers. Um, and we asked the question, uh, we actually added a lot more bells and whistles to it. It turns out in many of these simulation models, it's very hard to get changes in comparative advantage. And believe it or not, comparative advantage changes. That's a real hard thing to convince U.S. steel manufacturers. They still think it's the 1960s and 70s, and they've got a comparative advantage in steel, um, and the world has moved on. Um, but anyway, 
So we actually try to build in uh, information about changes in comparative advantage going forward. And as part of a broader effort, we very much want to engage with Europe, Asian countries, the US, South American countries, and get information as to how they see the future of their economies evolving and what they think productivity growth is going to be by different sectors. And then we, we have our own views, um, but we think that uh, a conversation around how this might change. And, and let me put this out there. Um, electric vehicles, there's a very good chance that in 15 to 20 years there's an excess supply of electric vehicles over demand. Everybody thinks electric vehicles is the way to go. Everybody thinks that they're going to have be able to develop a comparative, I say everybody, a lot of countries, uh, a lot of sectors, a lot of industries. And I would argue that that uh, is very likely to result in a situation of excess supply, which then could result in government support to uh, those industries and a lot of inefficient and uneconomic activities being supported as, as um, uh, firms, sectors, countries try to compete for relatively limited demand. And I could talk more about that if you're interested. <clears throat> um, Brexit, I think we're going to have a discussion about EU integration and, um, uh, well, political change and dis disintegration. Brexit is something I get lots of questions about. I really don't want to answer those questions. So I've provided in my slides, um, and by the way, these slides are slightly updated from what I sent, is the UK government's analysis of Brexit. And that's basically what we say at the WTO. If you want to know what's going on with Brexit, talk to the UK or talk to the EU. Because uh, we don't know. Not sure they know either yet. So. Um, <laughs> But one thing we do know as economists is that trade costs are likely to change. Tariffs could very well change. Um, and so the UK government has done their own analysis that suggests that you know, a hard Brexit with no deal could take about 7.6% off uh, UK GDP. Very early on, right after the, you know, the, the Brexit vote, this analysis came out, and UK GDP growth was still fairly strong, and many economists were saying, see, all those models were wrong. Well, I think now those models are basically being shown to be correct. Um, and this is one of the problems with using these kinds of models, is you'll do a trade scenario, but you won't necessarily take into account interest rate policy changes, government fiscal balance changes, and what's going to happen to the currency. And what we saw in the UK was an interest rate cut uh, a reduction in the austerity efforts of the UK government and the currency depreciating. All of those things cushioned the uncertain, the blow of uncertainty at that time. Um, but now that uncertainty and those cushion, uh, cushioning effects are being overcome uh, by real world events. Now, we have estimates of the US China trade tensions of taking about a tenth of a percent off US GDP. US GDP growth of 2.6, 2.8%, that's not particularly noticeable. We also estimate it's about twice as negative for China. This is a bit high, by the way. In the baseline, we have 7.2% growth. It's probably more like 6.5 to 6%. Um, but those things are not necessarily very big, but those are the direct effects, the, the dead weight loss kind of effects of these policies, not necessarily what happens if we get big spillover effects, the kind of uh, animal spirits that Keynes would talk about into investment and consumption, although we see potentially some of this happening in China. There are other factors going on in China that are weakening investment and consumption. But um, there's also the trade, uh, trade conflict effect. This could now start to affect what we see coming out in the US in terms of investment and future growth. Those get bigger. Now, if there's an auto war, we see this result being about three times bigger for the US. And remember, trade US-China trade was about 3%. 
and you can do these back of the envelope. The models are very helpful to organize your thinking, and often they tell you something you miss, but some of the direct effect stuff from tariff calculations are very easy to do. It's how much trade, what's the tariff change, uh, what's the elasticity. I take about half of that. <laughs> um, now, we have also done scenarios around total breakdown and tariff cooperation. And essentially what we find there is it's a repeat of the great financial crisis. Global GDP drops by 2%. Global trade drops by more in the great financial crisis. Global trade dropped by about 12%. Our, our estimates would be that if there was a total breakdown in global tariff cooperation where every country tries to charge its optimal tariff, okay, it would then, trade would drop by 17%. Now, GDP, in fact, I had this question this morning. Why, does, why doesn't GDP drop more? Well, that's because you're substituting domestic production for some of those imports, okay? Um, but it's less efficient, and the long-term implications are significant. It means your production possibility frontier, your TFP, total factor productivity growth, will be slower, and so the long-term effects are much more significant than the short to medium-term effects. But it's very hard for us to predict what's going to happen to those TFP things. And we're trying to work with the IMF and World Bank and OECD to get a better view on that. I'm going to skip this because um, I want to get to some time for Q&As. We run a bunch of scenarios. So we talk about, you know, we have our baseline analysis for global trade. Uh, and the blue line is what it was in 2018. We project out to 2035. Sometimes we project to 2030, sometimes to 2040, sometimes to 2035. Uh, depends on the paper. <laughs> um, and in this case, we're looking at the US, EU, and China. We have passive isolation, active isolation of the US. Trade war, um, you can see trade war has big negative effect on US trade, um, but not that big of a negative effect on US GDP. Why? because it's a big, diverse economy. It can substitute for those foreign imported goods much easier. Um, you can have a breakdown in cooperation. And then we ask the question, what would happen if there was a WTO round? So if we successfully multilaterally reduce trade costs, and you see it's good for most of the world, um, although the EU is a complex story. Um, all right. I'm uh, sorry about the orange line around Canada. I was giving this talk last week in Canada, so they wanted to know what might be the effects on Canada. This is uh, from Nisida Oliaraga and Silva, optimal tariffs, their estimate of optimal tariffs. If you look down here, you can see that the US, in their analysis, has the most market power. It could ri raise its import tariffs to uh, by 57 uh, percentage points on imports. So it still has a lot of market power. If we did this for 1980, that number would be even bigger. It would only face tariffs on its exports, an increase on its exports of about 20%. Um, for Europe, it's pretty, you know, it's interesting. It's got market power too, not as much as the U.S., so it could raise its tariffs by 38%. And it would only face, uh, very similar to the U.S., an increase on its exports uh, of 22%. But if you're small countries, you're pretty much getting creamed. You have very little market power, um, and the tariffs on your exports are going to go up much more. So their welfare losses are going to be much higher. And these are the tariffs that we used in our scenario of a global breakdown in in tariff cooperation. We didn't look at services, so what would happen if the GATS went away? We didn't look at SPS, TBT. So this is not an estimate of what happens if the WTO goes away. It's only an estimate of a breakdown in global tariff cooperation. I want to go to China. Uh, this is some falling trade costs uh, and how we build those into uh, future Essentially, these are shifting downward marginal cost curves as a result of technological change by country, and it will vary by sector. The world's going to change in the future. Whoops, let me see if I can go back. Sorry. 
The world is going to become much more services oriented in the future. We think more services trade. We see manufacturing as a share of GDP decreasing and um, uh, an increase in services. We see a very similar role for uh, increase in services trade. Okay, now I'm going to close with structural changes in China. And this is some of the background. It's a working paper we've got. It's going to be posted soon. I think it's EPR. Uh, but if you want it right now, send me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, I actually started this work back in 2014. I uh, got busy joining the WTO and doing other things. And so I've just now finally been able to turn my attention to it and, and finish it up. What we look at here is China 2030, which was a um, basically uh, China's goal to rebalance its economy away from investment-led uh, and manufacturing-led to consumption and services. So it's going to inc increase, I'm sorry, decrease investment um, and turn away from being a manufacturing-based economy towards a consumption-based economy more focused on services. That is the likely economic development path anyway, but this is China's objectives. It's a plan they have, and they're working towards it. They're already achieving steps towards it. Um, and so we think, you know, given the historical uh, experience in China, they'll probably be reasonably successful in achieving their objectives. A key element here is we see a fall of the, the Chinese savings rate, um, uh, baseline projections show a fall to 42 percent. Uh, the World Bank DRC report suggested it would fall to 33 percent. We think uh, that there'll be continuing trends that keep decreasing that savings rate to 25 percent. We still think there'll be pretty significant investment opportunities. So what is a, lo a lot of what's driving our analysis here is the savings and investment balance and China becomes much smaller global trader, uh, and its surplus decreases quite a bit. Another element we bring in is Made in China 2025, where China focuses on selected sectors to raise their productivity growth. And our analysis here suggests that they, um, if they successfully uh, follow through with this policy, it will diminish some of the effects of China 2030. It'll offset some of the effects of China 2030. So China's trade balance in our scenarios, the baseline shows the trade balance out to 2040, uh, initially declining and then rising back up. In our scenarios, uh, and the ones that matter here are the, the red and the green. The green is China made in 2025. The red is the basic re uh, 2030 rebalancing. So the, the green is on top of the rebalancing. And you can see that there'll be uh, a movement of China to a trade deficit out in 2040. This is not a prediction. This is an illustration of the economic forces that are likely to be at play. And we've mixed macro forces in the baseline with micro policy changes. So we use this to organize our thinking. If somebody were to say to me, Bob, so in 2040, China's going to have a trade deficit, I'd say, I don't know. But I do know that there'll be economic forces driving it towards that. OK? That's what this tells you. Um, you can see that the um, share of Chinese exports globally in the baseline was going to rise to about 15% by, by the model projection. In the baseline, it declines. It's still a big trader, but it's down to about 9%, uh, 8.5%, 9% 8 ,5, 9 of global exports. But the difference between the red and green line is that China made, uh, made in China 2025. And you can see that it has a substantial effect on the decline in exports. So made in 2025 is likely to diminish some of the effects that one might see from China 2030. Concluding remarks. So that, th this, by the way, is supposed to illustrate 
that trade in the next 35, 30 to 35 years is going to change significantly. And the role of China in that is probably going to be fairly big. Oops, wrong way. So we've seen global trade change dramatically over the last 35 years. We think they're go it's going to change quite a bit over the next 35 years. In terms of GVCs, why shouldn't they continue to evolve? Now, if there's a breakdown in total co uh, global cooperation, you'll see a lot of onshoring, replacement of domestic ac economic activity for uh, cross-border exchanges. That's if there is a breakdown in global cooperation. I hope that there isn't, because that means that, we, and we didn't include it in our scenario, but if, if we had included a scenario for long-term projections in global um, cooperation, that we would, that low growth scenario in the first projection chart I showed you would decrease quite a bit. And I, would, it would, I wouldn't say there'd be no growth, not at all, but there'd be much slower growth, and the distribution of that growth would be quite different uh, than what we've observed over the last few years. Trade conflicts can be very costly, particularly if they affect the macroeconomic drivers. So I would argue that you, what you want to watch, you want to watch what happens to trade diversion, that's very important, but you want to watch what's happening also to investment. If there are auto tariffs, I suspect it's going to have big impacts on EU investment in autos. And then we can use trade costs, and this is something, so the, my, my typical approach is I like to use trade models, partial equilibrium, general equilibrium, to organize my thinking, and then I need to know what's happening to trade costs. And recognizing that trade costs has many different components, some are actionable by policymakers, some are not, and we need to track what's happening in those trade costs over time. And I'll close with that, Robert. Thank you very much.